Welcome everyone. We still have some people joining, so um, I think we'll wait a few more minutes to um, to let people join before we can start. But welcome everyone. Um, excited to know where everyone is joining us from, which parts of the world. Remember, there is always a possibility to also leave uh, questions in our um, uh, Q&A chat box. Um, you're welcome to write all the questions to the speakers there. I will also kindly ask you not to press the button answered um, and leave it in the state as it is there. Good morning, William, Niagara Falls, Canada. Excited to have you with us today. Let's give uh, three more minutes and then we'll kick it off. Welcome everyone who is still joining. Welcome, Marjan. We we'll have two more minutes and then we'll start. Perfect. I think we are ready to go. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Shemishina and I'm the CEO of Iconia, a company that is a creator of Project Malware. And I'm extremely happy to welcome everyone today on our co-hosted webinar together with the uh, Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, uh, which is dedicated to the discussion around the brutal history and enduring legacy of the Berlin Wall. And Project Mauer is a charitable NFT art project inspired by the true stories from history and parallels in our current world. And it is building a virtual memorial to the Berlin Wall to connect current and future generations with their history, heritage, and humanity. And Mauer is constructing a digital Berlin Wall to be specific of 10,316 unique art pieces, one for every day that the wall stood. So together throughout through the eyes of five different artists, Maori tells stories of a divided world with one common goal, to tear down barriers in our physical world. So we will first hear from the CEO of Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, Ken Pope, who previously had a 34 year career in the United States Army, consulting industry and academia. Uh, we're extremely happy to have Ken with us. 
Uh, Ken uh, had over 12 years of operational field work as an Army Foreign Area Officer with a focus on Russia and the Caucasus and Eastern Europe and security and um, worked with the security issues with a variety of assignments in Russia, Ukraine, Estonia, Azerbaijan, Georgia and Kosovo. And afterwards, we'll hear from Eric Sunero, the creative director of Iconian Maurer project in specific. And afterwards, we'll hear more details from Felipe Posada and, and Marjan. So Ken, we're glad that you are with us today and I'm pleased to give you the stage now so you can elaborate more on the history of the Berlin Wall and what it means today for all of us. Okay, well, well thank you. I, it's really a great honor to be here talking with uh, both the Mauer Project and Iconia. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing others' contributions. So I've been asked to speak about um, the history of the Berlin Wall and I think it's important to, to start from what it really means. So I think Berlin, the Berlin Wall became a, became a symbol of communist suppression around around the world, really. Um, when you uh, when the World War II ended uh, in Europe in May of 1945, the Allies divided and defeated Germany and also its capital Berlin between East and West. Um, hidden to many before and during World War II was the true nature of communism and the Stalinist or the Stalin communist ruler who ruled the Soviet Union. I think Churchill was one of the first to recognize. The, the real nature of the Soviet regime early and provided his now famous Westminster College speech in which he coined the phrase the Iron Curtain in March of 1946. Um, after the war, Stalin and the Red Army who liberated much of Central and Eastern Europe from Nazi oppression themselves became oppressive occupiers and they didn't leave Eastern or Central European countries until the early 90s. So this thing called the Iron Curtain became both a metaphor and a real physical barrier uh, that ran from the north of Finland um, along the, its border with the Soviet Union all the way down to the Black Sea, roughly 4,300 miles of walls, fences, barriers, guard towers, and at times even landmines. Uh, Berlin eventually came to have the same physical barrier. And Berlin also became the focal point, kind of early epicenter and often a flashpoint of what became the Cold War between the Eastern Bloc and the Western Allies. And the first crisis in Berlin came in, in March of 1948 with Stalin um, ordering a progressive tightening of the blockade around Berlin. And by the end of early, that month and into early April, the Berlin blockade became total. So the only way into the western part of the city was by air. So the allies led by the U.S. and the U.K. knew they could not let this stand and started what became known as the Berlin Airlift in June of 1948. Uh, Stalin and the East German government thought that the Western allies would capitulate fairly quickly because it was just so much of a challenge to get everything into that city by air. But they surprised everybody, uh, both the allies surprised themselves and the Soviets um, with the success of this operation. And in a rare admission of defeat, Stalin lifted the blockade in 49, May of 49. But this Berlin crisis demonstrated the desire of the Soviets to control and solidify its expansion in Europe. And, but it also had the unintentional result of highlighting to the world um, the true nature of Stalin's regime and his goals in Europe. Um, so through 48, though the, the blockade of 48 failed, East Germany and the Soviets had, however, succeeded in effectively sealing the border between East and West Germany. West Berlin, though, was still, still free, but it lay 110 miles behind the East German, East German border. Berlin, like Germany writ large, was occupied, if we remember back to our history, by four allied powers, the French, the Brits, and the U.S. and the West, and the West and the East were the Soviets. And up until 1960, all, Ber all Germans in Berlin could travel freely between the occupied sectors in Berlin. And the East Germans quickly began to appreciate there was a significant difference between how we're living and their West Berlin counterparts were living. And the East began to hemorrhage citizens rapidly. In 58, is coming to a head. Khrushchev sees the danger and announces that if the West doesn't demilitarize the city, he would turn it over to the East Germans. Um, so why did so many of the East Germans want to leave the so-called communist workers' paradise in the East? And I think a lot of it was both the system in place, communism, but also the different approaches the occupied zones had. The U.S. and its allies invested in rebuilding Germany, West Germany and Western Europe, while the Soviets really focused on reparations, taking away from the East Germans and basically punishing them. And the discrepancies became almost too much to bear. Economic conditions, the freedoms they didn't have, and that's why many of the East simply wanted out. So this migration crisis in, you know, from East to West kind of came to a head. It was a catalyst for the Berlin Wall. By 1960, this increasing flood of East Germans fleeing communist oppression became overwhelming. 
And by 1961, there were approximately 3.5 million East Germans had escaped communism, many of that number through Berlin. So on August the 12th of 1961, the East German Communist Party leader, Walter Ulbricht, signs an order for the, bar for the bar barricades separating East and West Berlin. So the wall construction began then, the next day on 13 August 1961. So wire goes up, walls start to go up. Eventually, over the next several months, it's going to surround the entirety of West Berlin, about 90 miles of walls, fences, barriers, guard towers, and also landmines. Um, West Berlin now becomes literally an island of freedom in the sea of communism in East Germany. And you have all these famous scenes we, we've seen over the news over the years, and we'll see some of these today, hopefully. Checkpoint Charlie, the uh, the U.S. Um, entry point and exit point. Um, you see the U.S. and Soviet tanks kind of muzzle to muzzle about 100, years apart, 100 meters apart. We came very close to war at that point until Kennedy finally accepts the reality of this wall and states, though it's not an ideal solution, uh, but a wall, as he said, is a hell of a lot better than a war. And that's how it remained from 1961 until 1989. This Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall stood as kind of a symbol of communist oppression, cruelty, and, and deprivation. About 100,000 people tried to escape. Um, 5,000 were successful coming into, uh, into West Berlin. Those who failed to escape were harshly punished. And sadly, over 140 people lost their lives trying to escape over or under the Berlin Wall. But by this time in the 80s, um, the crack of this kind of rotten facade of communism throughout the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, Central Europe is beginning to crack. Um, I had the opportunity twice in 1987 to go to East Berlin, uh, part of the U.S. military, observed the May Day Parade. Very different than how the West looked. The people were very different. They were very cowed, obviously, by the system they had lived under for so many years. And um, the main drag in East Berlin looked pretty nice. But if you go a few blocks off the main drag, it was still bombed out for World War II. Again, just not a, a means to fix a city like the West did. And then a month later in, in uh, June of 1987, Reagan issues his famous challenge to Mikhail Gorbachev. And when he says, Mikhail, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, really kind of starts the ball really to pick up momentum then. In April of 1989, the border guards are told no, to stop using firearms and lethal force to prevent border violations. On the 4th of November, more than a half a million people participated in a pro-freedom rally in East Berlin demanding free elections. And then, thankfully, on the 9th and 10th of 1989, November 1989, the crowds move to the wall and start tearing the wall down piece by piece using their hands, pickaxes, sledgehammers, and shovels. Uh, but that really still wasn't the end. We didn't have the complete end until 31 August 1994 in a ceremony in Treptow Park in Berlin marked the end of the Russian military presence on German soil. And the German, uh, the Russians left and Germany and Berlin were now truly free. And that's kind of a very short, quick history of what took place with the Berlin Wall. Look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you, Ken. It's, it's, it's extremely insightful. And thank you so much for such a brief summary. It's a very complex topic. We all know that and very sensitive. So um, uh, very much appreciated. And now I'd like to pass the spotlight to Eric, uh, the creative director of Econium. So Eric, you were at the roots of the malware creation in its early beginning. Can you tell us why Econia chose to do it in the first place? Um, thank you. Um, well, um, we were kind of um, we we're getting into the space of, uh, of NFTs and uh, and smart contracts and so on, and uh, we knew that we we were kind of discussing what we would be able to do, uh, and what we knew we wanted was to make it kind of more accessible and more uh, understandable, I guess, relatable to a broader uh, audience. Um, and what we were seeing, you know, back then, still see a lot of is mostly like very niche, uh, kind of nerdy um, art uh, related to more uh, with. Well, you can you can discuss the substance of it, I guess, but <laughs> we felt there was uh, something to be done differently there. And uh, just to you know uh, make it a very a lo long story very short. Um, at the same time, um, as we were discussing what we could, you know, do, I um, happened to be talking to my father about an old family friend 
uh, called Jane, um, who has an amazing story. Um, American uh, woman who moved to Germany uh, at the exact same time as the wall came down. And uh, he described stories that I hadn't really heard. I think I was too young to really understand the context of it back then. Um, but how she used, you know, the basically the heroism of her and her late husband and how they help people um, using her American passport, uh, escape and move information um, between, you know, East and West and and um, eventually how she got to do, you know, well, both get her kind of with um, her testimony uh, preserved in the, by the Berlin Wall Foundation and so on, but also do very amazing things like advising on uh, the Steven Spielberg movie, uh, Bridge of Spies as well, because she was, you know, one of the real experts on how, how did the border crossing really, you know, uh, take place and, and so on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I brought this up uh, and yeah, this is back in the days, um, our families um, hanging out and, and you can see here, this little guy here is actually me. So you can understand why I was a bit too young to fully understand what was going on. Uh, this is our family's uh, interaction. This is my sister at the, at the Berlin Wall back then, at one of these lookout posts, uh, my older sister. So um, yeah, that was the kind of the background of it. And uh, so we thought, yeah, this is very interesting, you know, and, and also connects to something that we wanted to do to preserve this. I mean, this same seemed like one of the really interesting um, opportunities with, with uh, blockchain technology, to this preservation of, of kind of human memory and, and uh, um, important stories like this. So yeah, we started out by making, we did a, a interview with Jane, uh, which um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can share the link later. It's well worth watching a uh, 45 minute interview of her story. Uh, I highly recommend you, you check that out. And uh, yeah, that was kind of uh, <laughs> the reasoning behind it. Uh, and then we came, we worked a long time on kind of what, kind of concept we wanted and what we realized quickly is we wanted um, because all, um, while, you know, the Berlin Wall was uh, obviously, you know, a German uh, thing, it was also felt very much. And I think kind of Ken uh, intimated at that as well, that it was, had a global impact um, and became a global story. And so we quickly realized that we wanted to uh, represent basically the world as much as we could, you know, uh, to be represented in the creation of this. So we wanted, we realized quickly we wanted several artists, also as a kind of um, nod to the fact that you had this art on the Berlin Wall, which was very, you know, uh, mixed and uh, kind of uh, eclectic and um, artists doing uh, very, you know, advanced painting and very uh, simple painting and as an, you know, expression of their frustration and their uh, feelings towards this, um, oppressive monument. So um, yeah, we uh, connected it as well to, to the number of days and so on. So um, yeah, and th that, was, uh, that was the background, um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I'd be happy to answer questions if there are. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and yeah, reminder to um, ask questions if you have any and to put them in the Q&A chat box. Uh, kind reminder not to press uh, the button answer. And we will address all of them um, at the last part, at the last section of the webinar today. Um, now we have a great opportunity to hear from two extraordinary talented artists uh, who joined us today on the panel, uh, who were and are part of MAUR, uh, Section 3 and 4, Felipe Posada and Marjan Mokadam. Uh, so Felipe is a creative artist from between his native Colombia and New York. The last city would be the place where his creativity exploded. Uh, also, the invisible realm is uh, um, Felipe's professional identity, uh, who works uh, as a motion designer, visual artist, and director. For us personally, for Iconia, Felipe's approach to artistic creation is an approach of a true explorer who is not afraid to be direct and, I would say, even complex in his uh, compositions. So, but then we also felt that the way Felipe works with the space and uses his artistic language to explore the matter and to bring up the discussion would be a unique opportunity to explore the history of the Berlin Wall in the context that we did wanted to uh, research. Uh, Marjan, on the other hand, uh, she arrived in the United States as a political refugee during the Islamic Revolution in Iran, and she has a long and remarkable career 
um, in digital art starting in the 1980s. Um, she's also known for her original and unique and influential style of 3D figuration and animation. And she is indeed uh, considered one of the top female 3D CG artists in the world. Um, Marjan's perspective for us um, is one of the reasons why uh, it was extremely interesting for us to collaborate together was that uh, Marjan's background, personal background, but also the depth of her the artistic communication was beyond what we could imagine really, um, because she brought back the history. Uh, she managed to capture it in the moment and uh, she also made it alive. But um, I will show that, uh, we'll showcase that to you um, in a few seconds. Uh, so you have a, a better understanding. But first, um, let's start uh, with um, with Felipe. And now I'm happy to give the stage to Felipe, who will explain his focus in Mauer. And Eric, um, uh, you're welcome to share the screen to show a little bit of the artwork to um, the audience as well. Yes, Felipe, your hoping, stage. Uh, yeah, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll give the word to Felipe in just a second. I was wondering, do we have an opportunity to send out the link so people can join the? Yeah, uh, uh, I think you can uh, push it to the Q and A, uh, and I will um, uh, try to push it to the audience so everyone can see that. Let's try. Um, so, how will that work? If you can type uh, the link into the Q and A chat box. Um. So that's the question. Where is the Q and A chat box? Uh, it's in the dashboard below. Yeah, I don't seem to get the... Uh, um, hmm. You don't have a possibility to... Uh, no, but type? if you can um, try to, if you could possibly uh, post a question and maybe I can post it as an answer. Because that seems to be the what I can do. I can type an answer maybe. Mm, no, not from my side, but maybe we can uh, do that um, at the end. We can try uh, to figure out. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll answer William here. Um, but that was. Okay, that worked. I think yeah. everybody should so see if, now the link. If you see the link in, uh, I answered William Jack there. Good morning from Niagara Falls, Canada. And you can check the link out there. Just to invite people, this is one of those, one uh, um, an open gallery uh, where anyone can uh, come in and join me. Uh, but uh, now over to, and I'll walk around this gallery basically and show you some of Felipe's art while he's talking. Over to you, Felipe. Super. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure and a great honor to be here um, sharing with you. And um, it was a pleasure to take part in this amazing project. So to tell you a bit about myself, I'm a, I'm a visual artist, digital artist, creative director. Um, I work uh, with different tools to convey, um, you know, images and messages, uh, digital tools from 2D to 3D to these days even um, AI. And um, so, yeah, when I was invited to join this project, to me, it was a, a huge opportunity because on my personal side, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very respectful of history. Uh, and and this topic to me has always been fascinating. I was just so you know a young boy when the Berlin Wall fell, but you know it sent ripples throughout the world. As Julia was saying, um, I spent half of my life in Colombia, where I'm originally from, and you know moved to the United States, where I continue my studies and I basically developed my entire art and design career in New York City. Um, so yeah, so you know the you know the message of the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, you know, kind of like the the search for freedom. Um, it just basically got to me wherever I was, even since I was very young. Um, so and you know, being also Colombian, we have our own you know struggles with communism in the neighboring countries, and you know, I don't want to kind of like go too in depth into that, but yeah, I mean, I've I've, I've lived it through a different, you know, scope or in different situations, but, you know, it's kind of like a world general situation. Uh, so since I was, if like being invited to take part on, on, you know, in a positive way to, to kind of like communicate ideas of freedom uh, and to translate some of these stories about the fall of the Berlin Wall to me was a huge honor. 
Um, so what did I do? Um, I kind of like dove into, you know, my history books, uh, started to kind of like, you know, revisit some of this, you know, anecdotes and experiences, you know, of people, you know, trying to overcome, you know, the wall and all the challenges. Uh, I settled, I kind of like gather information, uh, look, looking at it from different perspectives. Um, and when it came to creating art, I wanted to do something that was, um, you know, positive and uplifting uh, and that would touch in some of these anecdotes and real stories of uh, heroic stories of people. But since obviously we're talking about creating NFTs and creating art, which is kind of like, you know, directed to a younger audience, uh, I wanted to do something that was visually engaging, uh, you know, and just like, like my art itself just to bring a little bit of uh a little bit of humor not humor but like you know some likeness to it and some some sort of like sarcasm uh but still keeping things obviously very true and respectful to to the story that we were um going to tell uh so i i chose this uh family of characters i try to be as diverse as i possibly could to kind of like not focus on a specific gender or, you know, or, or race, but like just to try to kind of like cover humanity itself uh, and just, you know, gave this character some sort of personality and using digital tools and 3D um, create these compositions in which uh, every character would have the opportunity to revisit the scene in a different form or in a different type of situation. Um, and then kind of like create an interaction. Uh, I, I was working, you know, hand by hand with Eric and he would always give me feedback. Uh, and sort of like we treated it almost as a theater play in which different characters would play, you know, different roles and also, you know, take different, you know, physical, you know, stances in, in the scene and sort of like start creating this, you know, interesting and intriguing interactions between them uh, in which obviously there is always like optimism um, and, and the will to kind of like overcome uh, through, you know, through different type of like visual metaphors. Um, I also like, uh, you know, try to inject a little bit of some of my personal passions. And I, I know, uh, for instance, that David Bowie uh, played, a, you know, a concert uh, to kind of like support the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, there were also like, all, you know, this artistic sort of like events that happened throughout history. So, you know, in, in, in very subtle, uh, you know, uh, imagery, I kind of like try to kind of like bring those type of messages, either through a poster in the wall or through like an actual, you know, character like the star man, uh, just kind of like, you know, interacting with everyone else. Um, obviously there was the whole like military aspect of it. So, you know, I, I, I brought that as well, uh, you know, but in a way trying to, trying to be, you know, as respectful as I could. And just like in a theater play, there's, you know, the good guys and the bad guys, but without like making things too kind of like extreme. Um, so yeah, you'll see through, through the different scenes, like different, uh, events in which there's always the hope to escape, to overcome, uh, and to yeah, and, and 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 to look, you know, for a better future. I think this is amazing, also because every, because we we were basically combining different characters and layers with the use of technology and the way you know it created this unique pieces, the way it generated this uh, thousands of pieces, and, and and it just opened up the new story of it, um, including you know all. all all the symbolism that you um, put in there uh, with your initial artwork input and what, what we had um, um, in the output was uh, extremely interesting to see as well. It was like a story in a story. Uh, and these are ones, uh, um, uh, the one that Eric is currently, was currently showing. Uh, there was the artwork that Felipe created in support of Ukraine um, with, uh, with which we were also able to uh, uh, help uh, uh, help the country who is currently affected by the full scale invasion uh, by Russia. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, uh, thank you so much, Felipe, for your input. Um, uh, reminder to 
um, ask questions if you have any to the artists and the artists will be able to uh, address them at the end uh, of our webinar. Um, and now I would like to uh, welcome Marjan, um, another artist of uh, Maur, and I would like to hear your story, your, your focus uh, in the project. Hi, I'm Marshall Mott, and thank you so much for having me today. And uh, you know, it's it, it it was such a wonderful experience for me to work on this project because I had a lot of personal uh, resonance with it. Um, you know, I'm originally from Iran, and uh, you know, I lived through the 1978 and 1979 revolution, where there was a sort of convergence between communist groups and Islamist groups, and even in the early uh, days of the revolution before I left, everybody sort of dreaded the comités and, and the comités were modeled directly after the communist party committees in the USSR. So I had some understanding in a limited manner of what it was like to live in sheer terror uh, of a totalitarian state at any given moment who could literally walk into your neighborhood and just, you know, arrest and shoot and kill people on the basis of an ideology. So I had a lot of resonance, but ultimately my story is I was able to get out. And you know, even when I got out in the 1980s, I mean, there were so many friends I know who, who had to like travel with mules across the border with Iraq during the war to get out. There were so many stories of these amazing escapes out of Iran, which are very similar to some extent uh, to the escapes from the Berlin Wall. There wasn't a wall, but there was the threat of getting killed when you were crossing the border. Uh, so in that regards, it was similar. But, you know, it was Berlin Wall was also a huge part of my generational experience. I went to international schools. Uh, and so we read a lot of Solzhenitsyn and I love Solzhenitsyn. And, uh, you know, so like my early teenage years were really color, colored by, you know, Orwell and Solzhenitsyn and that sort of thing. Uh, IB schools back then were heavily focused on the Cold War. Um, but, um, you know, I also recall when the Berlin Wall came down and all of us were like watching it. And, uh, you know, that that the 90s generation, we just like couldn't believe it. I mean, here was this unthinkable thing that had happened. You know, something that 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 just made it seem like anything was possible in our world. So isn't it interesting how the Berlin Wall has symbolized so much from uh, the, the dark side of the totalitarianism of communism in the 20th century to um, to the, the, the promise of freedom and how human beings can triumph. Um, so. Ultimately, I wanted to deal with those two key concepts, the fact that I escaped, the, the fact that people escaped. And the second idea was this idea of how human beings can indeed transcend even the most totalitarian oppressive uh, regimes. So for me, it really was about finding the heroes and sheroes. And um, so I had this concept of doing ordinary average everyday people uh, you know, five men and five women, some are young, some are old. And there were stories of grandmothers who escaped to see their grandchildren and so on and so forth. And I also work with the concept of people escaping through holes. And there were, you know, there's two types of holes in this uh, NFT collection. There's uh, the sewage hole and then the dug up hole. And then I had this idea that, like, as you mentioned earlier, I'm known for my, uh, you know, uh, original and unique style of uh, figuration in 3D CG. And I wanted to sort of show ordinary people going through this transformative process that turns them into heroes, that turns them into sheroes, that allows them to actually transcend oppression and totalitarianism and to do it in a way that was artistic. Uh, so that's what all the animations are about. Um, I should also add that I did, a, I kind of modeled a bunch of different walls uh, that were based on uh, the Berlin Wall. So I researched that heavily. And as you can see, a lot of the propaganda posters, and, and I had a lot of fun with those propaganda posters because I mean, some of them, you know, Eric was kind to translate some of them for me, like the American Beatles. And he explained the whole campaign of find the American Beatle. And, you know, so it was interesting because it was like peak propaganda art too on some levels. I actually found uh, the, the David Bowie poster for the famous concert on the other side. Somebody was selling it on eBay. So the actual poster that you see, that's the original poster that which I further distressed. 
And I think other concepts that uh, I work with is this is also um, to a large extent, uh, you know, usually I've been in, at selling NFTs uh, on, you know, super rare and other top platforms for fine arts usually uh, since two, uh, 2020. Um, but uh, something I can tell you is there aren't a whole lot of NFT collections that employ complex 3D animation and music. So this, this particular uh, collection is quite unusual in that regards. But one of the things about the music is I work with Blake Skipper, who did the music. And I asked Blake to sort of use uh, Heroes, David Bowie's Heroes, which was a song that was written about the Berlin Wall as sort of kind of like the inspiration for the guitar lines. But the interesting thing is during the huddle we did with the collectors before I started the collection, like the chat line fired up with everybody saying, you have to use Pink Floyd. And I was like, Pink Floyd too. And they're like, yes, you have to use Pink Floyd because that was a big part of the whole, uh, that era and the aspirations of people in Eastern Europe to join the West. And it's interesting because Pink Floyd was also the soundtrack for the Iranian revolution <laughs> in some strange way, the way Pink Floyd sort of weaves its way through all of these uh, political uh, upheavals. But um, so anyways, Blake ended up sort of doing a blend of a Gilmore guitar and the guitar line from Heroes. And um, so anyways, but to me, it's, uh, you know, these stories are always really interesting because there's, there's always that sort of tragic dimension. But, you know, what we also get from these horrific and tragic periods in history is, is the stories of a resilience, of survival, of endurance and uh, communist Russia and, and also other communist countries, uh, you know, probably killed more human beings in the 20th century than any other type of a political system. And it's important for us to remember that, uh, especially at a time when, you know, uh, people are flirting with uh, uh, communism and uh, idolizing it in a way that's completely stripped from you know, it's historic uh, negatives. So, and in, in that regards, it's a little unhinged in my opinion, but um, you know, it, it's, it, it, for me, it's really important also to focus on that, you know? Um, I mean, maybe it is the Solzhenitsyn thing. Ultimately Solzhenitsyn survived. He survived the Gulag. He survived the Gulag with cancer, which was his book, The Cancer War. Um, so it's astonishing how much he survived. And I think it's important for us to remember the tragedies, absolutely. And to keep that uh, in mind and to make sure that all generations, young generations, future generations, et cetera, are aware of the atrocities uh, and, and the negative aspects of totalitarianism and totalitarian ideologies and ideologies that are hostile to individual rights and civil liberties. I think that's really important, but I think we also need to uh, see the stories of uh, the heroes, the sheroes, the resilience, the survival, the resistance, the fighting, you know, the samizdat, you know, finding alternative media and ways of communicating through that alternative media in order to, to resist the totalitarianism, something that, uh, that is kind of happening on the internet underground now, as <laughs> people joke, in terms of the West. And the, then and the creeping censorship in the West, and so it's interesting to see that story continue. Yes, there's always totalitarianism, and we have to be on guard about it. And there's also the resistance to it. And uh, so I wanted to to really bring that into this story to make it alive for the whole world and also our moment in time. Thank you so much, Marjan. Uh, you're incredible in your research approach and um, also a reminder to, uh, yeah, again, as always, we have our Q&A and questions that keep coming up. Uh, uh, we will address all of them um, at the end. Um, and now I would like to use the opportunity to move to, um, uh, to the questions section, actually. Um, and as a nice, uh, I think, and also fitting um, continuation to what Marjan has been um, speaking about, I would like to ask the question to Ken. Um, and um, maybe uh, it would be good to hear about your historical perspective on the communism, communist heritage uh, that was left after the wall was destroyed. What would you say? What kind of tools uh, can we still see in our modern world? if you could um, uh, elaborate for us. 
Yeah, I mean that that's a great question. It's it's something that we we talk about quite a bit here as we're as we're writing more about it and doing more research on it. And so I, I think you you our last speaker Marjorie just hit it kind of well. They they have this overarching ideology um, that was you know fomented with Marx's uh, manifesto, and then you know Lenin turned it into the ideology and the system of rule that became known as communism. And they had once they had the ideology. They really only, if you think about it, they had two primary tools um, to both gain and maintain power. And the first tool was violence of all flavors. It could be, you know, anything from it started off kind of mild, like we think we we, you know, I think we in the West think we invented cancel culture, but it really started there. I mean, they they were more robust about it, obviously. Denouncing, and then it was you lost your job, you your, your family was oppressed. Um, a system of oppression, then it became, uh, we're going to send you to prison, it's forced labor, then it's it's executions, and it's just mass murder. Um, that's tool number one. Again, and famine, this murder through gross incompetence um, to these systems that people are trying to run an economy and an agricultural system that they've had zero response from the capital city of Moscow dictating how everything goes, and millions die. Everywhere it's been tried. Um, the second tool is what we also hit on a few minutes ago was total information control. They control the narrative, what goes in, what comes out. Um, eventually, it's no longer enough just to not say anything. Now you're being forced to, to parrot the party line. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was, was phenomenally astute about all this, having suffered under the system. Um, Havel, also very good, Vaclav Havel. Um, he gives this really interesting rundown of, uh, in his book uh, or his discussion on the green grocer where this, this guy is forced to put up this sign behind his uh, behind his little counter every day that nobody believes anymore. Workers of the world unite. Nobody believes that slogan, not even the people who made him put it up anymore. And he, but he puts it up because once he does that, he's now not only a victim of the system, but now he's also kind of trying to help, well, kind of perpetrating it as well, if you think about it. So I think that's that's where we are with you know violence and information control. We're seeing the violence now. You know, people ask me, well, is, is Putin a communist? I don't think so, because I don't think he wants that economy. I think he he uses those tools of violence and information control to maintain what's most important to him, and that's his place in power. And that, that's where we're seeing China, another great example, He's doing exactly the same thing, using the technology that Lenin and Stalin could only dream of um, to control their people. And what would you like? Would you say is it even possible to differentiate these tools in terms of which has um, the strongest effect in the society, or would you say um, it is by nature that they sort of work as you know as a complex machine uh, as a whole in a combination? I, I think it's I, I think it's really that they work in tandem. I think really because mm -hmm. the reason the total information control works because there's this threat of violence behind it. And violence can take many forms. It can take the form of, again, the things we talked about being denounced, what's kind of the mild low end of the spectrum until the point where they're just, they're marching people off to, to camps and killing them. You know, the, the painting behind me, Nikolai Getman, you know, he simply drew, what wasn't even him, in an art class. This guy, one of the one of his guys at school in an art class drew a, a, an unflattering stick figure image of, of Stalin and the entire class was sent to the gulag. He spent eight years in a gulag simply because somebody in his class drew something negative about Stalin. Everybody mm -hmm. went, he spent eight years there, came out and had did a hundred paintings about his experience in the gulag. Um, again, <clears throat> but he was being watched all the time. So we have this an image like the one behind me of a landscape and as soon as the MP, MKBD or the KGB guys came around and left, he would, you know, fill in the blank and put all the horror stories that took place there. So it's just it's just these two go in tandem. I think they're kind of inseparable at certain points. Yeah, yeah, that is that is, that that makes perfect uh, sense. And also, um, in reference to uh, witness of commun uh, victims of communism. Um, project uh, which is called witness project and um i think it's um uh it really goes uh, it really resonates with my project i would say because uh it features various um life experiences um under communism um could you tell us more uh, a little bit more about it and what was your approach and how how, how did you find those people right well it's you know we just 
you know, we had kind of have a network and we, you know, we we're, we have a website, we're online, we, we, we have con connections with different groups around the world. But, you know, I, I can talk academically about communism all day long, and but it's never going to resonate like it will for somebody to tell a group of students, well, this is what, it, what actually happened. You know, you, you little guy in the, in the back of the room who thinks he's a socialist or a communist will want to argue that point, but it's very hard to argue with somebody who, who lived in East Germany, for example, or who lived, you know, we have one lady, a remarkable lady, who was a victim of the killing fields in Cambodia and lost half of her family. She herself was abused, you know, raped repeatedly by the guards there. Um, just story after story, Venezuela, and you just, you name the country, we have people who have suffered. And the the thing is, it, it, the visual, the the words, I mean, it just it, it resonates so well with people like the project you're talking about now is people can see the images, images and video, especially to the younger generations now, are what really speaks to them. And I think it's important that we capture that and especially too capturing these stories before a lot of these people pass. You know, we want to we want to capture what happened to them and, and keep it for history so we don't have history repeat itself again, because uh you know, what we were talking about earlier with Marjan, you know, people seem enamored with this topic again. They think, well, you know, we, especially here in America, we are, tend to be very arrogant. We think we can do things better than anybody else. And of course, we could do this communism thing much better than anybody else. and We make it work right. Well, everybody around the world are smart, smart people everywhere. And nobody's been able to make it work because it's unworkable. It, it completely people misunderstand, you know, that advocate for this human nature. And when you start giving people that kind of power, it's going to be abused, whether it be in Iran or it's it's in the Soviet Union or it's in China. Absolute power corrupts, and we, we see that everywhere this goes. That is true. Uh, also, question uh, from uh, our community. Um, uh, how can individuals and organizations support the work of the victims of communism? Well, we are we are a nonprofit uh, organization, obviously, and we uh, we live and breathe by by generous donations from people who want to support our work. So, if you go to our website, the Victims of Communism .org, all all Victims of Communism one word dot org, there's a donate button, and people can donate that way. Also, if you have uh, individual stories, you know, or people, family members, or friends who suffered under communism or, or regimes like them. You know, let send them our way so we can make a video of them. We got it. We're doing another probably ten to twelve witness videos this year. Um, so we're anxious for more material to work with. So please, you know, help us with that. It's incredible work that you're doing, and um, for for Mauer especially, um, it was extremely interesting to um, look into the witness project and to. Um, um, to use the opportunity to tell those stories and to sort of um, um, commemorate them on, 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 on the eternal level, I would say, because it will be uh, published on the blockchain. The idea is that for our last section, we want to uh, capture every story, every character, um, and combine it with the artwork of the two um, artists, um, uh, Alex Andreev and Ilya Chichkan, who are working on the last section, and to um, tell those stories together with the visuals and to um, to create a real virtual memorial with real stories and so that the future generation, the current generation can can learn from it and, and, and to honor it as well. So um, we're extremely grateful for the work that you're doing and um, uh, it is, um, it is a painful topic, especially for me coming from Ukraine and um, uh, Really appreciate your work. Um, also, we had a question from Charles uh, to Eric. I will just, just uh, talk through it so everyone can follow. So the question was um, to Eric, the artists, uh, where would we be able to read the stories behind the pictures? Um, and the answer is that uh, we, uh, we published the link in our discussion, so you'll be able to um, see all the attributes on the um, OpenSea, which is the secondary market for all the artworks that have been um, created. 
uh, and um, the idea is that when the collection is complete uh, with the final release, the, the section number five that I just told you about, we'll be able to connect this uh, pieces to a wiki solution where uh, we'll be able to show the deeper context of the attributes and uh, so the, the story will will open up even more. But also, um, we what we also don't do, um, we don't give uh, a particular description to every artwork that has been created for two reasons. So first reason is, I, I think it's the um, uh, first one related to art artistic uh, uh, roots. So everyone should, um, you know, see um, what's the most important uh, in the imaginary, but, but it's also very hard to predict uh, what the, um, technology will generate as all those pieces are randomly connected and produce the story which is completely unexpected to anyone um at the end yeah um, I, I just wanted to jump in and say um generative projects are like that you don't know how the layers are going to combine in in the final result but i would like to add this that i made sure all the trait names sort of conveyed the essential idea so you know the grandmother who wanted to see her grandchildren the man who wanted to see us so all the layer if you can so it's a slight bit of a poetry that tells the stories in the names for each layer so uh, when you're looking at the traits read the titles and and a lot of those was uh, a lot of the a lot of the titles that uh, i came up with uh have to do with the stories that I have researched. Yeah, that uh, that is extremely helpful in these kinds of projects. So we really appreciate it. <laughs> um, also, um, questions, big questions to uh, Philippe and Marjan uh, from my side. Um, did you have any challenges uh, when working on that project? Because um, both of you had um, uh, your personal approach, your personal background, and um, diverse, quite diverse background. Um, was there anything that you found um, difficult? Um, Marjan, would you like to go first? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think the hard part of it was, uh, you know, I resolved for my own art direction to deal, to create a very dark scene. <laughs> so it, it's and it's like a challenge because uh, I'm you know I, I as an artist I want to create visual beauty and so what I had to do was to to uh, you know really create a dark and ugly scene and allow only the transformation the glitchy colorful transformation of the, the people uh, to be the beauty not the surrounding and, uh, but anytime, you know, I mean, when I was modeling the walls and constantly doing renders, I mean, it was like, you know, spending a lot of time with the, the type of visuals I usually don't do as an artist, you know, it's like, it's hard for an artist to say, let me create some, and I'm not like a, I mean, there are artists who work with like, you know, dystopian video games and things of that kind. I'm not that kind of an artist. So it wasn't an easy thing for me uh, to, to deal with the visuals that, really evoked that uh, sense of tragedy, of ugliness, of oppression, of living with desperation and depression. And, uh, and I had to do that just to let the, that moment of transformation shine and, and become the beauty. Thank you. Um, Felipe, what was, uh, what was it for you? Uh, uh, for me, challenges uh, arise more on the technical level, but not because mm -hmm. the project it, itself uh, was imposing me those challenges. It's because I really wanted to push myself even further um, and just deliver something that um, I had probably probably creative directed in the past with a larger team, but this time I was just hands on creating a lot of things so it needed it I needed to kind of like come to the box basically and, and and figure out how to render things in different perspectives and have the light you know hitting in you know in certain considerations for the shadows for everything to kind of like even though you would uh, since there was a, this was a generative project of multiple pieces that even if you would kind of like mix and match the different you know, characters in the different scenarios with the different floor and the different walls that everything would sort of like blend together 
and kind of like makes sense as a composition. So again, uh, I lean a lot, um, you know, into Eric and he was always super supportive and like, you know, we had a kind of like really cool uh, collaborative process of feedback and like fast response because ultimately I would deliver a bunch of different pieces and, you know, like it, it's basically like the composition multiplied by as many characters in there. So I know these guys had a, a, a bit of a, you know, of a hard time also like, you know, just dealing through everything. But again, we kind of like, I think we, we, we built kind of like a really good collaboration in terms of like, you know, naming the files and, 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 you know, just managing volume. Um, but, you know, ultimately it was incredibly fulfilling when we started to kind of like create the final generations. Um, my goal and what I, what I did to kind of like facilitate as much as I could was to, to put together some custom pieces myself, like final compositions that would kind of like help as a, you know, to inform kind of like as a guideline, how things should look. But in that process, um, I ultimately created this like one, like unique pieces that eventually became also important pieces in the collection. So it was just very, very fulfilling. And, 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 and that helped to, you know, to inform the team of, you know, how like all the other pieces would, would need to come together and just starting to see them coming like one after the next generation after gen uh, generation uh, and, and just, you know, creating these unexpected uh, compositions was, was amazing. So, yeah. It was just kind of like a <laughs> an overall incredible experience. I can Thank also you. just quickly add to that that um, mm -hmm. that is I've I it is very interesting this this um, creation process where what every single NFT is unique in itself and what if you own one you own that piece but how they're um, also part of this greater like like Felipe explains like it's actually one big piece of work as well which is uh, in so all the pieces are interconnected and uh, and actually on a deeper level part of the same uh, work so and which is obviously a very i think very fitting and very beautiful thought in terms of what this represents uh, in terms of the burning wall as well that um so so i think that's also uh, what you have to well it's easy for me to appreciate because like Philippa says i know the work uh, the amount of work both he and, and Marjan as well put behind it. Um, but I think, yeah, that's that's also what I encourage everyone to see that uh, these pieces are also part of this greater context. And uh, not only within each artist's work, but also uh, how their works with uh, these five artists, you know, uh, and how their works connect as well. Yeah, I uh, again, yes. And Eric, thank you for saying that. And I wanted to double down on that. Like, yeah, each piece, uh, to me, that's the wonder of this project is how every piece is unique uh, on its own. There's like, there are no two pieces that are the same, but at the same time, they all make part of a greater family, of a greater ecosystem and a greater world. Uh, and, and I like to look at each piece as almost like an, kind of like an Ikebana exercise. Like there's always you know like looking for the right balance the right composition but at the same time telling the story about the berlin wall uh in a in a kind of like a deep and respectful uh and intriguing way so yeah thank you guys uh, and yeah and uh, i will quickly add up uh, add from my side that um the the what's coming with the fifth section is uh, it's going to be completely different because their artists will be exploring the uh, the topic of the divide, divided world from uh, the perspective of um, current war in Ukraine. Um, so it will, it's like the whole project for me, it's like the 365 overview and uh, visual discourse uh, around the um, issue and, and issues of communism and, and, and its uh, impact on um, uh, the modern world and um, young lives, uh, the lives that even um, haven't begun. Um, so uh, we're extremely um, excited to see uh, how it will complete the whole story um, uh, this year. Um, but um, I'd like to use this opportunity uh, and thank everyone uh, from the panel 
uh, today for uh, being part of this important uh, discussion. Um, and uh, we're extremely happy uh, and honored to share this space with uh, Ken, Marjan, uh, Eric, Felipe. Um, and um, if, if anyone's going to have um, any follow up questions, we're happy to connect uh, through Victims of Communism. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for today's time. Uh, and it was an honor. One, one last one last thing before we go. Oh yes, yeah, of course. The, the, the last thing I wanted to mention that I, I you know that I should have uh, mentioned earlier. You know, I've been involved in, in not too many, but a few NFT projects, and uh, you know, we, and we've all seen the kind of like the, the rise and fall of, of many projects. One thing that I wanted to to mention here, it's also give a huge, uh, you know, props to the community, the Maurer community, and everyone who has supported the project, you know, by holding the NFTs and also uh, being involved. And, you know, like this project to me has been a treasure because it's it's real. I mean, like that, like seeing like real impact being made, like through charity um, and like the evolution of the project itself through the uh, on cyber galleries is just seeing it constantly evolve into something else um, and just seeing how everyone from the founders to, you know, us artists to the community members being so involved in it. I think it's just it's a project that to me has an amazing future and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited just to see what's what's to come. So yeah, this yeah. is also for the community. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And you know, uh, in the, in the, the recent days, because of the changes that occur to the global financial system and the devaluation of uh, the dollar and, uh, crypto Twitter was uh, saying, see, we told you NFTs and crypto are the future. Now that the U S government may need to back its currency with uh, Bitcoin. So uh, the, uh, crypto Twitter was ecstatic. Uh, although, you know, we'll see how these developments pan out. But I agree that with Felipe that, you know, I think that I've, I've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, NFTs uh, in terms of art sales. But uh, for me, I normally wouldn't do generative projects. And the only reason I considered doing this generative project was precisely because I believe in public art. Uh, I believe in artists uh, creating works that are meaningful, uh, that speak to history and engage history in a dialogue. This And this was a piece that was very personally resonant for me. And in closing, I will quote Solzhenitsyn, uh, live not by lies. I just add one thing to that too. So just, I just want to thank all of you. It's just really been a, it's been an honor to be here with you. And I, I, I love your work. I appreciate all that you, you put into this, telling this very, very important story. We tell an important story here too, through our museum. Um, it's, First of its kind, dedicated to the victims of communism, two blocks from our White House. Um, we would love to eventually see something like your project in our temporary exhibit gallery to show people do a do a you know virtual reality tour would be really great. So think about that. We can be in touch and talk about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It'd be an honor yeah, to. It'd be an honor. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, uh, also that, uh, that, that we're extremely happy to um, collaborate with with you guys um, because um, and Ken with you specifically because um, I think combining the art and, and the technology for the educational purposes and the, the kind of the informational and, and, and knowledge reserve that, that you have, I think this is the great opportunity to you know open up this topic even more which uh, I don't think has an end, unfortunately, but um, yeah, but uh, we're extremely glad to use this opportunity to get